All right. Welcome, everyone. It's great to see you all joining on LinkedIn. Welcome to another episode of the Paint and Pipette podcast. I am thrilled to welcome to the stage with me legendary founder, co-founder of Wired Magazine, Kevin Kelly. Kevin, thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure, privilege, honor, and I'm so excited for this conversation. Yeah, likewise, likewise. Folks who are familiar with my obsessions have probably seen one of your bits of advice uh, countless times in various forms from me. And so I thought it'd be fun to start here. Um, one of the things that you say in your excellent book, Excellent Advice for Living, is it takes a multitude of bad ideas to get to a good idea. It's a deeply held belief of mine, but I'd love to hear the story of how you discovered that and how you keep reminding yourself of it. I think I first observed this in other people, artists working, just um, hearing about their journey and, and the, the number of iterations that they would go through. And I think I made it personal when I started to collectively work at places like Wired where we'd have story ideas and realizing that um, quantity was very important in creativity, that you needed lots of things and most of them were going to be thrown away in order to get to, get to the great things. You could get to good pretty easily, pretty fast with a few things, but to get to great you really needed to have quantity. And um, that was borne out even myself when I started and have been um, photographing all my life. And I've done some things that were published by Tashin and other publishers, Life Magazine, um, which was to get to a great photograph, you just really have to take a lot of them. I mean, you can't, you can't say, I'm just going to take one <laughs> great picture. Um, and so... Um, there was a famous uh, experiment done with some art students in a book called Art and Fear. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there were two teachers. And the story that they tell was around ceramics. But I think the actual um, experience they had was around photography, but it doesn't really matter. What it was was they told the students at the half of the semester mark, they said, okay, at the end of the, year, at the, end of the semester, you're going to be graded. And there's two ways that you can be graded and you have a choice. Mm -hmm. You can either um, submit a, one or two things and, and um, we'll grade you on the quality of those, or you can give us a bunch of ceramics and we'll grade it on the weight. Okay. How much? Like if you do 50 kilos or whatever it is, you're going to get a grade on the quantity. And they said the curious thing was that every single time that the best piece of the year was always being generated by the people who went for the quantity. Fascinating. So Fascinating. there's something about doing things on a regular basis. And I think part of it comes from, and this is my experience as well, which is that um, you have to, uh, you have to iterate your way to things and you have to throw these things away. And um, the only way you can do that with ease is knowing that there's more where it comes from. Hmm. Right. I mean, if you, if, if you, if, if the process is so laborious and hard and difficult that throwing something away after you get there is devastating, then you're not going to be able to, to do that you have to make it kind of easy where the generation is easy. And that's where you comes into making it a habit where you kind of do something every day or you do something daily or weekly, knowing that most of what you produce is not going to be saved in that certain sense. And so the, so this idea that you have to make lots of bad ideas to make a good one, lots of bad versions of a chair to make the great one, and lots of, bad versions of a movie to make a good one is that, or a great one is, is that you are going to do something on a regular basis because that is something that loosens up the juices, but more importantly, it enables you to say, to, to, to believe 
I can throw this one away because there's a lot more. I know, I know that I've been doing this every day and it'll just come up and that act of actually getting into the moment will produce things. And so I'm not afraid that I'm going to run out. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe to use a personal example, I was, uh, I was talking with my brother earlier this week, who's got a construction roofing business in Texas. And we were talking about how to acquire customers and things like that. And I noticed this phenomenon just sitting around the campfire with my family, that the tendency is to fixate on a good idea. Yeah. You know, and, and people, and I've observed this in, you know, boardrooms is the same thing, but sitting around, there's something very personal and almost visceral about, about sitting around the campfire with my family. We got a biz, you know, ostensibly a business problem on our hands and everybody goes, huh. and what I know is nobody here wants to throw out a bad idea. Right, right? Right, right. So the question that I found myself and knowing I was going to talk to you yeah, this yeah. week, I kind of found myself thinking, how do you start to normalize that? It's one thing for, yeah, 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 for yeah. you to know or for me to know a multitude of bad ideas is necessary. How, and especially maybe in the context of family is weird because there's yeah, no yeah, hierarchy yeah. there. But like, how do you start to normalize that? Because I found myself throwing out bad ideas and everybody's like, no. And <laughs> even though I know bad ideas are important, I find myself kind of sulking, like, well, never mind. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How do you, what do you do there? How do you help a group of people recognize the importance of that and then actually that, uphold that value? That's a really great question is normalizing it because that's what has to happen. Um, you know, cause I've been, I've worked in many um, scenario workshops where we try to um, uh, elicit visions of the future. And the important thing we always say is that these are plural. They're, they're not single prediction. These are plural. You have to make lots of them. And so the way you normalize it, I think, is role modeling it, is, is to say, um, and maybe even explicit if it's a group, is, which is there are no bad ideas. You need to have um, a, a good idea. I mean, you need to have some bad ideas to make a good idea. But even more importantly, I believe that sometimes the best solutions will come from a really bad idea. Mm. And so one of the, the little bits of advice, I think it's in the book, I don't remember now, which is that if you make a list of, uh, of, of try to make a list of like all the bad, the baddest ideas, the worst yes. ideas you can think of. Yes. It's likely that the seed of something that actually becomes the best idea will be embedded in some of the worst ideas. Mm. These kinds of things that are improbable. And that's because what you're looking for is something improbable. Right. A really, really good idea is an improbable idea. It's, it's not going to be the first thing that comes to your mind. It's going to be hard to get to it. And actually going in the other direction of trying to think of something, it's kind of easier for us. It, and you just said you have more permission mm. to kind of like just make, make lists of really, it's easy to make bad ones. And so you can kind of go further by trying to actually deliberately create like the worst idea that you could think of. Yeah. Because then at least you're kind of getting away from the norm. You're getting away right. from, and that's the hardest part in the imagination business in is leaving behind what is expected, what the convention is. So, and so this, and so having deliberately having bad ideas, the worst ideas helps you get away from that. That you're reminding me of a couple of practices. One is I know at second city, I had the privilege of getting to know Kelly Leonard who runs a good, portion of second city the famed improv mm -hmm. you know, uh, site in chicago it's launched so many famous careers and one thing he said that is one of their uh favorite activities is they call them bad brainstorms mm -hmm. and once a month they have the bad brainstorm where they basically take all the ideas that they, everybody's responsibility is to bring an idea that they say we'd never do this right and, and i similarly i think steven tyler has talked about um, once a week, they would have what they call a dare to suck meeting, 
where mm-hmm. every member of the band has got to bring just a terrible idea. And he said, right, right. most of the time they're terrible, but every once in a while you get a dude looks like a lady. You know? right, right, right. And, and there's something about that. Even Nolan Bushnell talks about that at Atari, having bad idea brainstorms. But yeah, I want to, yeah. I want to go so, now. So, you- I, I just want to follow on there. Cause Brian Eno has something he, he does with the bands that he's trying to produce, which is to have them at least some point, um, play each other's instruments that they can't play mm. Mm. to make bad music because again for the same reason that we're talking about it 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 puts it out of the ordinary constraints that you have pushes it way out and just that release from the expected can lead to other things yeah yeah and and letting i think even setting that expectation that the goal is to vary from the norm right and variation if you think if the mean behavior is here sometimes the best way to get over here is actually to, you know, to sling, you know, it's like, I don't like these space movies where there's like, you got a slingshot around, you got to use the gravitational pull. It's all, there's something about using yeah. the gravity of the wrong direction to get in the right direction. Right, 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 right. Exactly. Yeah. You, you had said about um, cultivating imagination or you said in one of the, one of the excellent uh, pieces of advice that imagination is a muscle and you need to, exercise yeah. it. It reminded me of something I read Thomas Edison said, said there are three qualities essential to an inventor. Um, and one of them was cultivate imagination. And the thing that struck me is, I think, especially in the circles where I run with a lot of organizations and leaders, imagination doesn't seem like a cultivatable thing. It can almost mm. seem binary. Either you have it or you don't. Yeah. No, and, I don't. And I, of course, I know you don't subscribe to that, but yeah, I don't yeah. either. How, how would one, if you were going to advise someone to think about building the muscle of imagination, what are some, and bad idea brainstorms perhaps being one example, what are some other ways to build the muscle of imagination? Yeah, and, and there are different varieties of imagination. It's not a singly dimensional or unidimensional thing. They're, they're like, like when I think of some of the most imaginatively creative people that I know or the most imaginative people, they're imaginative in different ways. So I have one friend who's a very imaginative person. He's, he's a storyteller, a writer, a science, science fiction. And so his imagination abilities are often about being able to fill in all the details of Mm -hmm. an imaginary place in great detail. And that's like a superpower. And then I have another friend who is really good at lateral thinking, just coming off from the side. And that's a kind of an imagination. Yeah. And then, and then there's uh, a, another friend who um, can uh, immediately, you know, with a hearty thinking, rattle off variations huh. of, of things, you know, just, just, instantly making long, long kind of combinatorial, um, exhaustive searching the space of, of possibilities and can just can enumerate them very, very quickly. So, so there are different kinds of imagination that I would say, and I don't I actually haven't seen a taxonomy of that, but that would be really good if someone were to work on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, those probably take different kinds of muscles, but I would say the 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 first thing for for cultivating it is that what you said it, it is a habit. It is something that you get better at by doing a, a lot, right? I mean, so that's mm-hmm. one thing. And I would say the second thing is that, like we were just saying, um, you have to. I, I talk about advice elsewhere in the book about divorcing the genesis mode of thinking from the critical mode, yeah. both of which are absolutely essential in making something great. So there are, there are, there are functions or rhythms. And one of the rhythms is that in the genesis period, you have to protect that from judgment. Mm. You have to be utterly non-judgmental and not even talk about bad ideas or good ideas. They're just ideas. And that initial moment, the initial cycle, you're producing things without judgment and you're trying to, what I would say, to surprise yourself or to surprise the world or whatever it is. 
you're really trying to, 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 to generate something new and you have to protect that. And that's in the improv world, you're mentioning it. They're very, very, very strict in that one cardinal rule, which is that you can never say no. No blocking. And right. 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 You, you build on, you don't ever deny something. And so in that same spirit, that's part of the training to be imaginative is protecting that initial genesis of not saying no, of not being judgmental, of not actually trying to be critical about it. You have to do that at the next step. Right. But you can go back and forth. Do, 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 do. Um, but you want to be non-judgmental. So that's hugely important. Can you talk about for a second about space for practice and how we think about that? I was actually speaking with a leader of a large hospital system. You have 20,000 employees in this hospital. And he and I were talking about that, this idea of practice. How have you seen it effective to actually operationalize practice? I realize that's like a, that's a very official sounding thing, but it's one thing to, to say in abstract, you should, you know, have times where you don't judge, right? But in terms of implementing that in the context of, say, a team or an organization, are there any practices that you have seen successful in actually carving out the space for practice? Yeah. Um, you, you kind of immediately constrain the, 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 the thing to talk about teams because a lot of creativity is one person or maybe even a partnership people who are writing, you're trying to write a letter, you're trying to work on a logo, whatever it is. And so um, there, that comes down to, you know, your, your kind of personal habits and your, your, your whatnot. Doing it as a team is, is, is another, is another ability. Uh, and, and, and what they have recently kind of found is that brainstorming is not necessarily the most efficient way to generate creativity. They've done testing in terms of people evaluating the novelty, whatever it is, founding, mm -hmm. founding that just having a bunch of people throwing up ideas is not necessarily the most efficient or productive way that actually having individuals work on their ideas alone at first and then bringing them together yeah. actually produced more valuable outcomes. So, um, so that's maybe part of, part of the practice um, of, um, you know, working. But, but the one thing I, I, I am sure about, and, and, and I think I would apply to this, is that this has to be an ir iterative process. It's, it's, you do it, and then you do it again, and then you do it again, and then you do it again. And yeah. it's not something you do once. It's something it's like that, a blue pill. Like I know right. Kung Fu, <laughs> right. I know creativity. I took the right. pill. Exactly. <laughs> you, it's built into the process. And um, I really like the way, I mean, the, the way that Hollywood makes movies these days is that um, it's a very collaborative thing. There are a lot of people, but they, they're, they're kind of prototyping and making it in an, iterative way the entire way you know they start mm -hmm. off with scripts which go around and around and around with many layers many people involved with trying to be creative and imaginative um maybe working at home and then passing them on for for feedback and then moving into where they make storyboards um, which is another level of, of things another kind of imagination required for that and then they make animatronics and things where they actually make versions of the film based on like the storyboards and then they make a version of it where they have scratch sound and voices and so they right. by the time that they've come up to the end they've made the movie in many different ways and thrown out many versions of the movie along the right. way right and that idea of again and again, round and round coming, having the Genesis, protecting it, having the critics come back and say, this is terrible. We're going to, we're going to throw this all away and then going again. That process is, is, is the only way you get to the great things. Mm. 
Yeah, it's uh, you know, it reminds me what you're describing. Uh, it reminds me of Ed Catmull's Creativity Inc. and describing the process at Pixar. And I love the way he says he says our job is to take movies from suck to yeah. not suck. Right. Right. <laughs> and we can think like you know something like Finding Nemo. It's like the immaculate conception, right? It's like this yeah, yeah. has always been an amazing. Rather than like the thought that there was a point in time in which Finding Nemo, to use his word, sucked. It's yeah. hard for us to do, right, as audience members. Like, it's always been amazing. Well, even their first one, Toy Story, um, it sucked so bad that they were, like, going to um, completely abandon it because Woody was not the Woody he was now. He was a mean hmm. guy. Bitter, and it's like right? people hated him. I mean, people, the viewers who saw it, they hated Woody. And so they had done some level of, of making the movie this way and it just wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and that's, that's something else, by the way, that's Pixar and other places, but Wired, it was my own experience. Um, Wired was a monthly magazine. And the, the thing about it was you would think after seven years, whatever it was of doing this every month, that it would become like a formula and you would come to Friday night right before deadline, everybody would go home. That never happened every mm -hmm. single time. It was a near death experience. It was just a miracle. <laughs> the issue was put out on time. And that's true of every Pixar movie, every movie. If you hear the full stories, it's a miracle that it ever was finished, let alone great. And it's because, basically, it's because we were always upping the game. Mm -hmm. We were always trying to make it a little better. And you're just always pressed to the wire there's always some drama about something that doesn't work. It's, it's the real world. It's real life. And so um, having, you know, having done 10 Oscar winning movies, the next one will still be the same thing. It'll be a total miracle right. that it ever gets done and that is good. Right. Yeah. One of my favorite examples of that is the, uh, I don't know if you've seen the comedian, the documentary yeah. about Jerry Seinfeld. Right. You know, you think if anybody could just, you know, go on Letterman tomorrow, it's right. Seinfeld, right? Because especially after the height of his success, but seeing, no, it takes, you got to get in the comedy club night after night and bomb night after night right, 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 right. and develop the material. But that's so, it's so counter to, I think a lot of us could see somebody like, you know, see Finding Nemo, Nemo and think those Pixar guys are geniuses or see, uh, you know, Seinfeld on Letterman and go, well, it's just because he's funny. And we don't appreciate all of the iteration that goes into him looking like a genius in those 15 minutes, right? Right. How do you think about, uh, one thing you speak about several times in the book actually is deadlines and the power of deadlines. Yeah. And, and I know that's true, you know, and you're saying it's like a near-death experience. It's hysterical yeah, every, yeah. every time. And at the same time, we also have just talked about the good idea comes relatively early, but if you want to go for the great idea, you've got to kind of persist or endure an ideation longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how does one balance the value of a deadline with the somewhat, it's also arbitrary. Like, is it possible that a better idea is beyond the deadline? I, it may be possible. How do you, how do you balance those two forces? Yeah. So the deadline, the chief attribute of a deadline is that it takes something that's abstract and perfect and it makes it real, which means it has to become imperfect. And so you're going to have to ship something that's imperfect, but that means it's real. And so that's good. Um, the deadline and, and, and the thing about it, in order to get there, you have to give up perfection and you have to be different, different than what you thought you were going to be. That, and that's, again, if you go to the story of anything well done and creative and great, it didn't begin that way there was some some way that it was made different in order to ship it and so um it, there there is there is you know an art a balance between um wanting the very very best could be and the fact that we're limited in in our time and that's the only scarcity there is in the entire universe as far as i can tell mm. is our own time and uh, having a billion dollars doesn't give you any more of it so so it's the thing there's a bit of a wisdom i think it's i put it in a book that um came from a book called writer's time which says that basically 
any kind of worthy project, whether it's a film or a book or a podcast series, whatever it is, the work involved in making it great is infinite. It's bottomless. There is no end. Right. And so you can't really manage the work because mm. it's infinite. You can only manage the time you have for mm. it. Mm. It's like, no, I'm going to do the very best thing possible to do in six weeks. I, you know, I, I found that the, I, I, and I'd be curious actually to hear your experience of this book. I only have one book. You have many. The thing that was astounding to me is a book is in some sense, it's like a snapshot of your knowledge at a point in time. Yeah. And I've noticed like people ask me to talk about me, but if I do a keynote or something, yeah, I noticed the other day, I tell basically three key stories in my standard keynote. Right. Now. Right. Two of them are not in the book. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I learned them after it came out. Sure, 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 it's sure, like sure. astounding to me. I mean, there's actually research I think is seminal and central. The research I actually looked in the index of my own book. Uh, I didn't even reference the guy. <laughs> it's like, yeah, the extent well, to which we like uh, you underestimate how much we, one continues learning. Be, you know, true. the editor is like, Jeremy, we cannot put another story in this book. It doesn't matter that it's the perfect illustration of dot, dot, dot. Yeah, 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 exactly. Are, are there things that you feel, you know, you hit publish, so to speak. I realize yeah, yeah. I'm involved. Is there stuff that you go, if I could immediately, you know, put out the second edition today, I can't believe I didn't say this. Are there things that have. Well, I have, I have a list of about a hundred more bits of advice that I'll, I'll probably try to squeeze into the uh, paperback. Um, wow. But um, yeah, it's, I, I joke that the best time to write a book is a year after you've written a book and given a talk for a year, mm. because then you know, it's about, and that is the best time to write the book. Yeah, is 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 when you've figured out what it's about. Because even by the time you finish a book, you're still you still don't really know what the book is about. But if you give yeah. talk after talk after talk about it and hear people's reactions, you get a much better idea. And that's the time you really want to write it. We can't tell the publishing industry this. That would just be, it would it would send them <laughs> in a death spiral. So one of the things you mentioned is the daily practice. Yeah. I know that you've been making a piece of art every day for a long time. But lately, with the last in the last year, it sounds like with generative AI. I before you get into the specifics of it, can you talk about why that is a touchstone of your life and in, in terms of habits that you have maintained? Um, I, I always liked drawing as a kid. I um, have always been painting and drawing, and later on, photography took up some of that visual creation aspect and I was photographing constantly um, of course even things like wired was um, a nice convergence to me because it was very visual and so mm -hmm. not only was it the ideas and the text but it was a very visual thing which I really really embraced um, doing it one a day came about because I discovered a tool that I'd always wished I'd had and that was procreate on the iPad so the thing, the one challenge for me as a visual artist, painting and drawing, was control of color. Color mixing is an incredibly fine, high art skill. Yeah. It's an art in and of itself. Yeah, that people don't realize how amazing it is. Someone who can do it well. So it's like this. You're going to you say, I want to make this particular color orange exactly like that. And you have whatever it is, four colors you're starting with. It's really, really hard to do and yeah. to do consistently and again and again. And so um, with the computer, the iPad and the Procreate, I could get those colors without having to mix them. I could find those colors. I could slide through. And suddenly I had this sort of ability that I didn't have before. And that kind of spurred me to want to try and do something every day as a means of um, looking. So the, so the thing about um, photography was, for me, photography was a very compelling excuse to get out of the house and look, mm. see things. And painting something every day was forcing me to look 
Um, you know, if you try to do anything realistic, the only way you can paint a realistic thing is to really look at yeah. what it is. Look at a mountaintop and see how that snow fits on there in order to be able to paint it. The same mm -hmm. thing with tree bark. You have to kind of really, really study it in some ways. And so drawing and painting every day was, was an exercise a lot in trying to see. And, and um, to, to, to ask the obvious question, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Why, why is seeing important? Seeing. So I, uh, I talk about like um, a lot of the thing about talking about the future is really what I call predicting the present. It's really like, can you see what's actually going on right now? Yeah. That is like, if we can see, if we can understand what's actually going on right now, that's half of the way to understand what might be happening tomorrow or the next day. And this, this necessity to see what's going on, I don't mean just even visually see, I mean like to see, to understand, to reckon with, to comprehend, to absorb. So I think observation is a key skill for um anything that we're doing and you know the best writers are incredible observationalists they're yeah they're, they're able to write this because they're observing things in, in a way that's almost extraordinary and so i find that you know painting and, and photography helps me become more observant mm. and so so you you shifted it sounds like from procreate to what's your tool of choice now so i'm using the ai's mid journey we just re just released a new version dolly stable diffusion but even photoshop now has built in ai they call it um generative fill right, right. which is amazing and i and I, I haven't released some stuff, but I'm fooling around with my my photography to try and do something. So I I see the I, I think of these things as co co generation. It's not just the AI. It's not just me. It's a partnership. It's a, it's a teamwork. And um, sometimes I am feeding into the AI artwork that I've made as a seed. Um, so so I'm really it's really collaboration in, in many ways. And I'm and just can, seeing, talk, talk about, can you talk about the collaborative dynamic? Yeah. 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 So, um, when I was doing my, the, my own painting every day, I had one goal cause I would sit down and I would have usually zero idea about what I was going to paint. Yeah. And I had only one goal, which was, I wanted to surprise myself. Mm. it's like i have no idea but i want to do something that i had no idea that I, that was there. that was in there <laughs> kind of, a, was kind there. of a it was, i did that wow so yeah. where did that come from so it's like you know it's like i have no idea what this means i have no idea where it comes from but here it is and so mm -hmm. ai is the same kind of surprise um but the collaboration is is really um striking because it's very <laughs> easy to get these current versions of ai to produce something that um, may surprise you, it's very, very hard to get them to do something that obeys you. Hmm. So, like, so like, yeah, they'll make something. It won't be great, but it'll be kind of interesting. And then to try and move it in a certain direction is really difficult. There is a constant nudging. It's like trying to move a mule or a donkey. It's, it's like there's some, it, it doesn't really kind of want to go in your direction and you have to use all these tricks and skills and prompts and whispering to try and move it in certain directions. And the epiphany that I had recently is that there were lots of things that I was trying to get it to do. I just couldn't get it to make this kind of art. And I realized the reason was, is because this was art the transcended language hmm. and the large language models 
the only way you get it is using language. And if you can't, right. If it, if it, if you, if it can't be expressed in words, you can't get the AI to make it. Right. So, 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 so that's, so there are limits right now. There are limits to it. They can't do language transcendent art. You can only do or seem to produce art that's tethered to language. Is there, when you talk about the collaboration and the interplay, how many back and forths with the AIs would you, to make a single piece of art, I, I almost, the way I kind of think about it, it's almost like photography. It's like, yeah, you know, like if you go on vacation, I just had recently had a family vacation. Mm -hmm. How many photos do I favorite? Maybe, you know, three, right? How many did I take? 300. Okay, so yeah. I got a 300, I got a 100 to one ratio. Yeah. Of call it input to output, so to speak. Yeah, when there's... you think about your collaboration, what's the interplay ratio like? Like to get a photo you're satisfied with or an image you're satisfied with, how many nudges to the mule are you giving? There's certainly at least 30 generations, I would say. Mm. Um, 30 back and forth of this thing here or not, this going back and forth. Um, so so there's, there's, and it can be hours can be hours to 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 get something that's worth sharing let's say and um uh yeah so 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 it, it is like photography in that you're kind of stalking through a landscape and you have these hunches that there's something promising here and you're going to kind of be patient and you're going to kind of explore this little corner of interestingness and you're stalking through it and you're taking little steps and you're moving through and occasionally you're kind of walking over the hill to see what's there. So it is in many ways for, uh, similar to the, what's the word I want? The topography of doing photography as a concept where you are hunting for things. Right. You know what that you're helping me kind of crystallize. This is really cool. And it helps explain something. I'm undertaking a modest research study right now about generative AI and its impact on collaboration and team problem solving. I've survived 14 years at Stanford having never conducted proper research, but somehow I got roped in. A friend from Harvard said, hey, let's do this together. So I've been working on it. What we're, what we're doing is basically doing kind of control group and research group, side-by-side -side studies. You could say, okay, at the Long Now Foundation, you go, yes. hey, a problem we're trying to solve right now is how do we get more people asking long-term questions? I don't know, whatever it could be, right? Well, what we do is we take a control group and we have them, we give them a scaffold for a problem-solving activity. Um, and then, and we're measuring kind of qu quantity of output. We have the, the problem owner measure the quality of the ideas, you know, grade them A, B, C, D, whatever. And then we have a research group we give them the same structure, they get the same grading rubric and everything, but they get access to generative AI as kind of a, you know, ideation partner. And then we're comparing the quantity and quality and the feeling. How does it feel to be a part of a problem solving group? You know, they're doing this long now problem. What's your attitude toward collaboration, towards ideation, all these things before and after. And then we're comparing that with the group that has the same structure, same team kind of composition, but then also has access to AI. Um, and we've been finding some interesting things. One of them is, and granted it's small data set at this point, but one of them is the AI groups actually are generating less volume of material, despite the fact that it has infinite capacity to generate more. So that's interesting. There's also AI is generating less D caliber work and less A caliber work. It produces yeah. a lot of Bs and Cs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah not yeah, a lot yeah. of A's and Ds. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and what what you're I, I think. As you're describing the stock, you know the yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. you know the topography. What I'm realizing is, I think a human problem solver is kind of looking for a good enough solution. Yeah. And when you think about photography, somebody really wants a spectacular photo. They're going to stay up late. They're going to trek in another mile yeah, deeper, yeah, right. right? All this stuff. And there's not maybe by virtue of the comp, the the mm -hmm. actual structure of the task mm -hmm. we aren't giving people time for stalking i'm not sure they're interested in it by the way because it seems like wow yeah. we got five pages of documentation on a b plus idea in like five minutes we're yeah. done right yeah no and so, i don't know if we yeah. gave them a hundred more hours they would spend much, I, I think yeah, they'd probably yeah. just refine that right i don't know you yeah, know so, so so these are all trained on on the worst and best of human creation so they're basically will produce the average. Mm. They're, they're, they're basically tweet 
to produce plausible human responses or creations. That's that's by the nature of these large language models and these transformer models, they're going to produce the average. And what a lot of the nudging happens, particularly in like say chat GBT, is is nudging them not to be average. To right. like, okay, you've got to be- uh, pretend you're an expert. Don't give me the average thing. Pretend you're an expert. Mm-hmm. Try mm-hmm. here. So you're 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 constantly the, the, the temp, not the temptation, the default for all these AIs is to produce plausible right. human, average human generation. And you have to really push them and work hard to get them out of the average. Well, you, you, you know, it's funny is going back to the beginning of, beginning of our conversation, yeah. we need them to do a bad brainstorm. We need an yeah. AI to do a bad brainstorm and then give the AI the challenge to flip the bad brainstorm into good right. stuff. Right, right. <laughs> And so there are people who are much better at this than others, maybe by a factor of 100. Mm. And part of it is um, these AI whispers is because they spent the 10,000 hours, the thousands of hours doing, and they have some idea of what works and what doesn't work. And just just yesterday, MidJourney released um, a version, a new version that has this really kind of cool thing called shorter prompt. And what it does is, it actually gives you the weights on the prompts that you have, the weights of like how important that prompt is or not. And it turns out mm-hmm. that a lot of the words that people were putting in did nothing. Real? They don't. They don't. They don't advance. They don't, the they don't change anything. Wow. And so a lot of the the really good prompters knew that from wow. just experience right they would kind of they would kind of converge on those kinds of of words that they knew would actually make a change versus just things that other people were using you know like putting in high res nikon you know whatever all this stuff which made no difference whatsoever right, right. and so right. um part of what we're discovering again the, in the masters is is that some people are much better at getting them to produce great stuff because they've put in the thousand and they, and they, and they've come to realize or see or understand what works and what doesn't work, what moves them, what can get them nudged out of the ordinary into something great. So it's like any other tool. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. I, I have one more question on another piece of excellent advice before you wrap, because I'm dying to know, you, you say you need to make explain the problem a part of your process. Yeah. Can you can you say can you just give us two clicks more on that? Yeah, that's that's actually um, borne out by both some studies. And I think there's a book that's gone into the details of this, and also my, my own experiment experience, which is that um, when I get stuck on something, I, I have a, an assistant researcher. And um, I'll begin to explain the problem. And then the middle of explaining it, it was like, oh, oh, I, wait, 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 I, I, I get it. Just having to explain step by step what it is, there's something magical about that yeah. that will often provide the, the, the answer. And so um, people who teach troubleshooting, make that part of the process of troubleshooting that, that when something is not working and you can't figure it out, you try things, you have to explain it to somebody Mm. what the problem is in a very step by way step process of explaining what's not working. And it's amazing how often the answer will come from yourself as you're explaining it. And I don't know why that works other than it works. No, it's great. Is there any, when you say make that a part of your process? Yeah. I wonder, are there any other steps that you would encourage people to make a part of their process, so to speak? I mean, with troubleshooting? Yeah. Um, part of the process. I mean, it's like part of the creative process. Well, um, I mean, it's a good, it's a good question. So, uh, when I, when I, I mean, I'll just talk about my own process. So when I'm embarking on something new, not necessarily troubleshooting, but a new process, I like to um, get like a survey of like kind of what's 
out there? What's a picture of what I call of the landscape? I would just like to know a little bit about the landscape. Yeah. In, in particular, I'm, I'm, I'm interested if somebody has already done what I'm wanting to do or whether it exists or something similar. Um, so that's, for me, part of the process. Part of the process is um, the snapshot, the landscape. And then um, uh, part of the process also, um, I find, is to articulate a little bit about what success would look like. I, I, I your outcome variable. Uh, right. Talking about experimentation language, it's like what what is the what are we measuring at the end of this thing? Well, like okay, like a book because I, I I do a lot of talking with people writing books, and I always start with the end. It's like okay, let's say this book was successful. How would you define success? What does that look like to you? What what will it accomplish for you? What does it if it was a raging success? And I'm not talking about bestseller, but maybe that's part of it. What 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 does that is? I mean, what does it look like mm. and feel like and do? And so the so whatever project it is, if it's any significance, I don't mean like sitting down to do a daily drawing, but if it's a longer, bigger thing, it's like, well, what how will we know whether this is successful or not? Mm. Mm. Or how will I know? What 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 would it look like? So so that's starting at the end is 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 another part of the process. No, it's useful, right? I mean, again, I was I was talking to a leader just earlier today who was saying, if you don't define success ahead of time, right. then your capacity to rationalize, you'll declare anything a success later. Right, right. Well, that's fine too. You can do that. That's the Brian Eno thing. Is uh, you paint the arrow and then you paint the target around the arrow. <laughs> you know, I was oh. like. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, and I think I think this idea of inventing your own version of success is is very very important. You, but um, you should know what it is that you're doing, right? I mean, if 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 you're to say, well, I'm going to, um, if you're happy with declaring anything as success, is fine. But I don't think success has to be someone else's metric. You can make it up and declare it successful, but you do want to have some sense of that before you start is all I'm saying. Mm. And so maybe just to bring things full circle as it regards the book, uh, what do you see as success? And if folks who are listening, and I see a bunch of folks who've been dropping comments in the chat. Thank you, Jonathan and Francis and Michelle and Mahul and others. Um, what folks who, folks who are engaged, who are here now, who are going to be listening, um, mm -hmm. What do you hope they do with this knowledge or how can they support your definition of success for this book? Yeah. Um, I, I generate things primarily with, with an audience of one. Wired was invented, created um, primarily to be the magazine that we, the, the founders, wanted to read because it wasn't didn't exist. That's all. That's all we were doing. We were making a magazine that we wanted to read. We were the primary readers. When I gave assignments to writers, I said, "Your audience is very, very simple. It's not some eleventh grader or somewhere. It's me. Yeah, you've got to amaze me because I'm bored and I've read a lot. And so, um, when I did the photo book the audience was me i wanted to make one copy if i had one copy of my vanishing asia that's all that's all i, I needed mm. but since i'm making one and it's printing i'll just make a bunch of others and if other people wanted to join me it's fine this book of advice was written basically for my kids for me and the kids and if other people so it's already successful do, do, are, is there anything listeners could do to influence your children to really take it seriously? There... <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in having this, this audience of one and, and really trying to create things from a personal um, expression, from a personal drive, from making it idiosyncratic and you want to protect it as much as possible from the bureaucracies, from, you know, 
thought police and everything else going on. You, you, you want as much as possible, make it true to yourself. And so I think um, for me uh, at this point, the book is out and if other people find it useful, I am delighted by it. I know I've heard many people say, look, I have kids. My kids don't listen to me. I try to give them advice. They're bored by that, but they'll listen to someone else. So I give them your book and that's they're great. paying attention. Okay. That's great. That works. That's great. That works for me, and so um, so I'm happy when that happens. The one thing I might suggest, if I could offer one piece of guidance for folks who are listening, is don't try to read it in one sitting. Yeah. You know, this is there. There's something. There's there's always like this sense of accomplishment in our minds. You know, I want to get through this book. It's more important that this book get through you than that you get through the book, right? So to me, I would, I, and Seth Godin and I were talking about this when he was on the show a few weeks ago, but it's the kind of book, it's limit yourself to like two pages a day. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it, just because what you want to do is find opportunities to apply these truths because they're, the, the, the proof and the value is actually in the application. Right, right, right. It's really easy to skim through and go, oh yeah, that was a good book. But if you want to get the most value out of it, I, I have found, you know, by the way, just the other day I was doing a talk at Instacart in San Francisco with a bunch of people and they're super loud. And I started going, yeah, may I have your attention? <laughs> Whisper. Because of your line to get yeah. the attention of a crowd or a drunk. Just whisper. Right, right, and I right. told them, I actually gave you credit. I, you know, it's a well, hundred people. You. And I said, you know why I was whispering? Because Kevin Kelly said <laughs> that was the best way to get a crowd to be quiet. Right. But that would, if I had read that amidst a hundred other pieces of advice, I may not have remembered it because yeah, it yeah. happened to be in call it my daily reading. It actually had the opportunity yeah, to well, yeah. get implemented. Well, well, thank you. And and then for the benefit of those who may not know, the, the book has only aphorisms and proverbs that's the entire book it's 450 of these little adages and lessons and actually the original subtitle was called seeds of contemplation the idea mm -hmm. was that you would take these little seeds and kind of unpack them yourself which is what my my hope would be um and they're um as you said they range from the cosmic to the very practical so i'm really delighted that other people find them that way. One Cal um, was, um, he said it was like the Bible without stories. And uh, <laughs> well, that took as a compliment <laughs> because that's, that's great because I'm not a very good storyteller. So I went to my strengths, which is making aphorisms and little telegraphic tweets. And so um, that's what they are. They're little zip files that you Perfect. can unpack at your leisure. Yeah. And I would say, take it slowly. You'll find, I found lots of wisdom there myself. I thank you for putting it in the world. I still remember the day that you dropped the 68 bits of advice, which yeah. I think was kind of the starting point. Yep. We, I devoured that. We shared it around the D school community then. And now to see it, it much expanded in book form is a real gift to us and to the world. So thank you for putting it out there. You're very, very welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes. Thank you uh, for joining us today and folks, thanks for listening. And until next time, have a great weekend. See you all soon. See you.